Chapter 3 I should have looked at the invite before I said yes, Kelly groaned as she complained about the upcoming birthday party Bentley had been invited to. The address isn't connected to any bus route. I'll have to use a cab, which costs money I don't have. Then there's the gift. Any kid from first elementary would be happy to get a ten or twenty dollar toy. What do you get the rich kids? Josh, Patrick, and Bentley were all in Tiana's living room playing video games. That meant Tiana and Kelly could have some much-needed time together in the kitchen, attacking ice cream to soothe their woes. "'I have the solution to our problems,' Tiana said as she dipped her spoon in the pecan caramel. "'I'm all ears,' Kelly said around a mouthful of Rocky Road. "'Our kids are in that fancy new school,' she popped a spoon into her mouth. "'There've got to be at least two single dads in the place. I don't care how fat or ugly he is.' If he's got enough cash to send his kids there, I'll take him. Tiana, Kelly laughed. She tried to ignore that her mind immediately focused on Dylan Ramsley. She hadn't seen a ring on him, but that didn't mean anything. What? I can be a kept woman, Tiana said. When we were growing up, I thought your goal was to be a mom and housewife. Find Mr. Filthy Rich, and you can do that. I did get to be a mom, Kelly pointed out. How many kids did you want? Tiana asked. Before I knew what labor was, Kelly laughed. She tried to ignore the twinge in her heart that said she still wanted more kids and a loving husband. I wanted six, at least. I thought big families were awesome, probably because I was the only child for so many years until Mom married Moose and had Josh. See? Tiana pointed at Kelly with her spoon. Now is your chance. Is this guy single, the one who is hosting his son's birthday party? Yes, Kelly reluctantly agreed. At least, I think so. Then you've got until the end of the month to get him to think you're irresistible and ask you to move in with him. She grinned and sipped her coffee. I don't think he's the type to just shack up. Kelly rolled her eyes. I'm not that type either. You're in a desperate situation. Think of Bentley and all the advantages he would have as the stepson of some rich guy, Tiana said. You know that you could stay with me? But it's going to get crowded. I have three roommates. It's the only way I can make the bills work. I know, Kelly sighed. I'll probably end up back at my mom's. Tiana made a face. All the more reason to snag Mr. Rich. Is he cute? Kelly tried not to blush. He's not exactly hard to look at. You think he's cute, Tiana grinned. Spill. Okay, Kelly laughed. He's got really great eyes and an amazing voice, the type that just makes you feel gooey inside when he speaks. Oh boy, Tiana was amused. You like this guy already. How's his figure? Kelly shrugged. Nice. Oh, so now you're trying to downplay it. Tiana eyed her. You had better stake your claim before I see him. I have decided I am in the market for a sugar daddy. Hey, do you have dad on your phone? Kelly suddenly asked. Sure. Tiana dug her cell phone out of her purse and handed it over. It only took a few moments to Google Dylan Ramsley. They looked at his picture together. He's nice, Tiana said doubtfully, not exactly a heartthrob. It's the glasses, Kelly decided. He would look better in contacts. Dylan Ramsley, COO of the Eastern Division of Ramsley Insurance, third son of Robert and Beverly Ramsley. Robert owns Ramsley Insurance. Tiana quirked an eyebrow upward. He's got big money, then. Kelly scanned the page. He's widowed, has three children, most of the rest is about awards and company stuff. Three kids is a lot to take care of. Tiana ate another bite of ice cream. He needs some help. You'd be doing him a favor by making him your sugar daddy. Patrick rolled his eyes as he grabbed a glass of water. Sugar daddy? Really, Mom? Hey, Tiana called after him as he left to go back to gaming. You will be thanking me when you can afford college. Kelly scrolled through the search engine results. She clicked on a random result and was rewarded with a picture. Oh, wow, look at them all. Tiana leaned in to see. It was an older picture in GQ of the Ramsley men titled Ramsley Brothers, Inc. All of them were in it. Patriarchy brothers David, Robert, James, and Oscar, each who headed up a division of the family business from pharmaceuticals, insurance, hospitals, and hotel chains. Then there were the men's sons, each of whom were part of the business. 
All wore expensive tailored suits and looked serious for the picture. There were fourteen sons. To the side there was one lone daughter, also in the family business. They throw a lot of boys, Tiana commented, reading the names. There's Michael, Noah, and Max. Kelly blinked. They look a lot younger. This must be from nearly ten years ago. Where's your crush? Tiana asked. Kelly shook her head at Tiana's teasing. He was easy to spot since he was nearly the only dark blonde in the raven-haired bunch. Dylan is right there. Brothers Jake and Everett. Tiana pointed them out. Fourteen boys and one girl, all of them working in their dad's business. Talk about family pressure. Kelly looked at the photo. Dylan looked so somber. Not much had changed, except Kelly thought he seemed sadder and a little older. She had this horrible instinct to hug and mother him, plus maybe do a few other things to him that weren't so motherly. Kelly sighed and looked over the rest of the names. She frowned. There's no Andrew Colburn Ramsley. Who? Tiana questioned as she looked over the men on the page. The guy from the hospital. Kelly gasped. I forgot all about him. Tiana gave her a puzzled look as Kelly grabbed her phone and called the emergency room extension. She checked her watch and was relieved that Clarissa would be on the desk. Hey, Clarissa, it's Kelly. Remember that guy, the hottie from exam room six? Andrew Colburn Ramsley? I was just wondering how he was. Kelly, Clarissa greeted her. I can't believe what Sandra did. Are you okay? I'm good, Kelly grimaced. I'll find a new job. It was wrong, firing you for helping that guy, Clarissa sympathized. If you need a reference, let me know. Thanks, I'll take you up on that. Kelly tried to steer the topic back to Andrew. How did he do? Is he okay? He went straight to surgery after you left, Clarissa said. Let me just check the records. Looks like he was admitted and stayed overnight. He's not in ICU, so he must be doing well. Good, Kelly breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks, Clarissa. She ended the call and was surprised that Michael hadn't snapchatted back a comment about Andrew. Maybe they were distant cousins, or perhaps Andrew had been truthful when he said he didn't know Max Ramsley. Is Max single? Tiana asked casually. Kelly laughed, happily married with two boys. She showed Tiana a picture from her Snapchat account of Max, Paget, and their two boys, Morgan and Ryder. She's beautiful, Tiana grimaced. I think we might need makeovers if we're going to snatch up some rich guys. I can't afford a makeover, Kelly sighed. You can't not afford one, Tiana eyed her friend. Think of it as an investment. Really, Tiana? Kelly lifted an eyebrow. Do you think anyone is going to be able to turn this from 14-year-old look-alike to suave and sexy? The dimples conspire against you, Tiana was a little disappointed. And the fact that I'm barely over five feet. Kelly ate another scoop of ice cream. I should be concentrating on getting a new job. How did the employment agencies go? Tiana asked. Terrible. It sounds like no one is hiring nurses right now, Kelly shrugged. Unless I want to move, which I can't afford to do. It looks like I need to find a job in another field until something opens up. Something will come up, Tiana tried to be positive. You're still camping with us on Thanksgiving, right? Always, Kelly agreed. It's tradition. Besides, Christopher's parents are looking forward to having Bentley for the weekend. Tiana rolled her eyes. I'm not sure you should let them spend so much time with Bentley. They take advantage of it. It's nice that they want to spend time with their grandkid, Kelly automatically said. Truth be told, she was starting to get a feeling that the Islingtons wanted more than just time with Bentley. Margaret and Terence had been not so subtly hinting that Bentley would benefit from living with them. It also helps that they are free for babysitting. I just have a bad feeling about it, Tiana shrugged. Enough, Kelly said firmly. Let's stop focusing on the things we can't change and work on what I originally came here for. I need to borrow your internet so I can put out my resume on job sites. Is that why I'm your friend? Tiana said in mock hurt. Only because I have internet service? Absolutely, Kelly deadpanned. They both grinned and turned to Tiana's computer. Mrs. Islington, good morning. Kelly looked up to see Dylan handing Avery his backpack. Good morning, she replied, ignoring the funny little bounce in her abdomen. You can call me Kelly if you'd like. Thank you, Dylan. He gave her the same courtesy. I know that the invitation to Avery's birthday is a little short on notice, considering it's this weekend. 
However, Avery wanted to ensure that all the boys in his class were invited. That was very sweet of him, Callie said. He's a good kid, Dylan acknowledged. However, I've begun to think that there might be an issue for parents without access to transport. Hiring a cab might be an imposition for some. It might be, Kelly allowed. She wondered if he was always this stuffy, or if he ever had any fun. He had two boys. Surely he played with his kids. I have talked to some of the other parents, and we have decided to put together a carpool directly after school on Friday. He frowned as he presented the solution. I also thought perhaps some of the new parents might feel a little uncomfortable allowing their children to go to an event like this, since they aren't familiar with Avery or myself. I have extended the invitation to parents as well. That way, there will be more chaperones and everyone can feel comfortable. That's a good idea. Kelly thought it was really nice that he had put so much thought into the matter. I hope that you and Bentley will come. He gave a small smile. Avery said that Bentley was in his reading group yesterday and they enjoy the same type of books. A dad who listened to his kids. Kelly thought that was a point in Dylan's favor. Not only was he cute, he was a good dad. He was also thoughtful of others. If he could loosen up a bit, he might even be more attractive. Kelly shoved the thought away. She wasn't here to score a rich husband. She smiled. Bentley said he was looking forward to going. There you are, Susan Hythe smiled the dentist's fortune in veneers and threaded her arm through Dylan's. I was hoping to talk to you about the upcoming Christmas fundraiser. Susan, have you met Kelly? Dylan asked politely. Kelly smiled even as inwardly she acknowledged Susan's blunt attempt to ignore her and snag Dylan away. She wondered how long Susan had been pursuing him. Mrs. Hythe and I have met. Oh, Susan tittered. She looks so young. I quite forgot you aren't a student. Kelly wondered if she should say something catty about Susan's age, but decided against it. Instead, she kept her smile firmly in place. Kelly's son Bentley is in Avery's class, Dylan added. That's nice, Susan smiled. If you'll excuse us, I'm just going to borrow Dylan. It's for the Christmas fundraiser that the school puts on each year, Dylan said. If you'd like to join our meetings, I'm sure we could use more help. I don't think that's necessary, Susan jumped in. After all, she's new and she doesn't know how things are done here yet. Plus, we have almost wrapped up all the details. It would be silly to add Kelly into the group and to have to catch her up on everything when we are almost finished. That's okay, Kelly forced a smile. It was obvious that Susan was trying to stake a claim on Dylan. Maybe next time. If you're sure, Dylan said. Absolutely. Kelly watched Susan drag him down the hall, chattering in his ear. She tried to ignore the sinking feeling in her stomach. Just because she thought he was cute didn't mean she had any sort of monopoly on him. However, he seemed such a nice guy, and it would be wasted on a cougar like Susan Hythe. Kelly hoped he knew what he was getting into, because Susan was trying to sink her claws in. Tiana, you would not believe it, Kelly said into her phone as she looked into the spa and bathroom mirror. It's huge! A mansion! There has to be at least six bedrooms. The garage has five doors, and it's enormous! Five doors! He's one man! Who needs five cars for one man? Maybe there's one for each day of the week, Tiana suggested. Have you seen any pics of the dead wife? No, Kelly frowned. Is that weird? Maybe not. Maybe it means he's gotten over her. Does he wear his ring? She asked. No. Kelly looked into the mirror. Was that a wrinkle? With these high-definition light bulbs, she was seeing things that her low-watt bulbs were missing. Susan Hythe. One of the moms at the school has been attached to him like glue and glitter. She's ready to change the no-ring status any time he gets a clue. This mirror was so clean. Kelly wondered how much he paid his housekeeper. Then you need to bounce her out of his way, Tiana advised. Get him to him first. He's yours. Kelly laughed. He's not mine. You just think he's cute and he gives you tingles. Tiana was exasperated. You will lose out on him unless you can get him to like you. I don't need him to like me. I need his kid to be good to Bentley so that he has a good time in that new school. She could just imagine Tiana rolling her eyes. How much? What? 
How much do you think he spent on this party? I don't know, Kelly said. There's a bounce house in the backyard. A clown was hired. All sorts of rides and games. It's like a mini kid's carnival. He has a mansion and five cars. He dropped at least a hundred grand on all the first elementary kids for lunches, uniforms, and a shuttle. Tiana sighed heavily. Yet you want to not even be in the competition for him. Get that sugar daddy. He's a nice guy. Kelly felt a spotless white towel. It had to be the softest she'd ever laid her fingers on. Who happens to be rich? Tiana crunched down on something. Kelly could hear her chewing through the phone. Go get him. I have to go back to the party. Kelly rolled her eyes. That's my girl. Chase him down. Tiana cheered. Okay, hanging up now. Kelly ended the call. She gave herself one last look in the mirror. She had gone with jeans, sneakers, and a sweater. Her hair was in a simple ponytail. She looked fourteen if she was lucky. Not exactly worthy of competing for the guy. Kelly shook her head ruefully and exited the bathroom. She was surprised to find Susan in the living room all alone holding a backpack. Can I help you? Kelly asked sharply. She recognized Bentley's bag in Susan's hands. Oh, Susan jumped, startled. I wasn't expecting anyone to be here. Why aren't you out in the yard with everyone else? Why are you holding my son's knapsack? Kelly cut straight to the point. Susan had a nervous laugh. I saw something glittering in the zipper. Really? Kelly conveyed her disbelief. Care to share? Oh, Susan fake gasped. Look at this. She pulled out a silver chain with a ring on the end. It glittered in the light. Wow, Kelly said flatly. I wonder what an eight-year-old boy wants with an engagement ring necklace. I especially would like to know where he got it and when he managed to put it in his backpack since he's been in the backyard the entire time we have been here. Really? Susan blinked. How do you know that? Cut the bull, Susan. Kelly marched over and took the necklace. I don't know why you're trying to plant this on my son, but he didn't steal it. I don't know what you're talking about, Susan said. All I did was accidentally find it. Right. Kelly said sarcastically. I'm going to assume that it belongs to Mr. Ramsley. If you'll excuse me, I will give it back. Thank you. I'll take that right now. Dylan came forward into the room, extending his hand. Kelly handed over the necklace. He glanced at it before pocketing the jewelry. You do understand that there are security cameras all over my house? Dylan asked casually. They came with the house, and I have never bothered to learn how to shut them off. Susan paled. Kelly wondered if there were cameras in the washrooms. She hoped not. She hoped there weren't any audio recordings of her conversation to Tiana. That would be embarrassing. What if someone had chili or a burrito? Who would want it to have their after effects of that recorded? Kelly shook away those thoughts. Rich people were weird. She wouldn't want any cameras in her house. You could tell me how my wife's engagement ring came to be here when it's supposed to be my daughter Shannon's room, or I could just rewind and play the recording. Dylan's voice was flat as he looked at them. You know, I just remembered that Philip has a dentist appointment, Susan smiled. We should probably go. Kelly, I'll let you explain about how you found the necklace in your son's backpack. Wow, Susan, Kelly laughed. Did you not hear about the cameras? Just confess and be done with it. He's going to watch it all later anyhow. I don't know what you're talking about, Susan said coldly. Susan, Dylan spoke calmly, your son, Philip, will always be welcome here as Avery's friend. However, I think it would be best if you didn't come over again. She blinked. I'm hurt, Dylan, that you would think such things about me. I'm going to collect my son and we'll be out of your way. They watched her leave. Kelly frowned. You don't happen to have cameras in the bathroom. That would be a little gross. There are no cameras, Dylan replied dryly. Then that whole conversation? Kelly looked at him in confusion. It was helpful to let me know to never trust Susan Hythe. Dylan took out the engagement ring. I wondered what she was going to do with it. Either she doesn't like me or she wants to get rid of the first elementary kids. Kelly shrugged. I did overhear her not being exactly thrilled that our punk kids were commingling with the nation's future. 
It seems a bit extreme, Dylan said. Maybe, Kelly allowed. Yet, if she wanted to have the kids from first kicked out of Livingston Academy, then getting Bentley suspended or a record with the police would be a good start. Then it's a good thing she didn't succeed, he remarked. Shall we rejoin the others? Kelly nodded and preceded him through the house. I didn't know that you had a daughter. Dylan took a moment to gather the right words. Her name was Shannon. Kelly stopped, walking to have a look at Dylan. He had such sadness in his life. She knew that he was a widower from the Google search. She hadn't known that he'd lost a daughter as well. I'm sorry. Dylan gave a short nod. Today is Avery's birthday. I'd like to try to keep it a happy day. Okay. Kelly reached out and put a hand on Dylan's arm, wanting to comfort him. It was easy to see that he still struggled with grief. I think you have done a really good job with all those games in the yard. Those kids are going to sleep really well after tonight, after all of the exercise. He gave a half-smile at her change of subject. Caden and Avery had a lot of input into what to get. I'm glad Avery and Bentley have become friends, Kelly said. Caden is amazing, by the way. I really appreciate how he handled Bentley's gift. He's a really thoughtful boy. Bentley had carefully chosen out a book that he knew Avery would like from their talks during reading time. However, one of the other boys had gotten him the book as well, and Avery had opened the other boy's gift first. Bentley had felt bad about getting a duplicate gift until Caden had piped up, saying it was cool because now his brother could read one book, and any friends he had over could read the other book at the same time for simultaneous fun. All the boys had agreed that it was a great idea, and Bentley had been happy to see that his gift was just as good as everyone else's at the party. He is eleven years old going on adult. Dylan agreed. I'm really proud of him. Do you know what that means? Kelly questioned with a smile. What? he asked curiously. That you're a good dad. She let go of his arm and went out the patio doors to join the party. Dylan watched her mingle with the kids, smiling and chatting to them. Most of the other parents were huddled in groups amongst themselves, talking or watching the kids. Kelly instead jumped right in, asking if they needed more cake or juice, serving and asking questions. It was obvious that she adored the kids. She had an easy way with them. He savored the rare compliment she had given him for a moment before rejoining the party. Dylan called Rhonda Coventry to meet him at Mercy Hospital Monday morning. He planned on giving her the case file for the hospital's previous insurance claims, the data for the new machinery and doctor changes, the compilation of statistics for plausible patient care in the aging demographic of the city, then see what she came up with for a quote. He had already run the figures through the company software, but it was still a good exercise. Dylan found that he could predict quotes. Then, if the quote given by the software happened to be out by a certain percentage, he knew that either he had made a mistake or he needed to look a little closer into the case. They toured the hospital with the board director. Insurance personnel were often given the royal treatment in an effort to lower premiums. It never worked. Also, it didn't hurt that he was a Ramsley. His uncle James owned a number of medical clinics and hospitals, including Mercy. Dylan kept an eye out for Kelly Islington. He wondered if she enjoyed her work at Mercy Hospital. He didn't happen to see her, and supposed she must be busy like all the other nurses that he happened to see. If anything, the hospital looked a little understaffed to him. Rhonda made notes, and Dylan pointed out various procedures that would impact the hospital's insurance rating. There were policies for liability, employee work injury, theft, billing concerns such as fire or flood, and more. They had to be thorough and complete with their report. By the time they finished, it was nearing the supper hour. Earlier, Dylan had his housekeeper, Maria, pick up Avery and Caden from school. He didn't often do that, but knew that the boys would love to spend some time with her. Rhonda suggested they catch supper while she tallied her quote and he could explain some items to her. Dylan would normally have waited to work on it tomorrow, but decided that since they were both hungry and professional, it wouldn't hurt. It would be so much simpler. We should go back to caveman times where you can just pick up a big branch, knock the guy over the head, drag him to your cave, and have your wicked way with him. Kelly stared into her drink. Of course, I'd have to tie him up. She was out with her friends for their annual tradition. It all started with a trip to the bar Lush and ended with camping over the Thanksgiving weekend. No kids, no parents, no work, just fun with the six of them. 
Kinky or you're just feeling some self-depreciation? Tiana asked for clarification. Both, I think, laughed Kelly. Hey, aren't you a little too young to be in here? A voice asked behind Kelly. Did they card you? Maybe I should call your parents. Very funny. Like that joke hasn't gotten old. Kelly gave Derek a dark look as he sat down at their table. Why are you so late? Derek rolled his eyes. The dragon wouldn't let me leave work on time. She actually thought I was going to work the entire weekend through. I had to remind her that this is the only weekend out of the entire year that I leave, turn off my phone, and I don't come back until the last moment. Bo picked up his beer. To freedom. Freedom, the group chimed, celebrating the toast. Catch me up, Derek requested. Tiana leaned forward. Bo got here first. Refuses to speak about the girlfriend. She's history, okay? Bo rolled his eyes. What was it this time? Derek asked. Knobby knees? Disproportionate teeth? Leave it. It wasn't a request as Bo downed his beer and poured another out of the pitcher. Bo was known to be picky about looks in his dates. Next? Derek asked. Bex got a raise and a promotion. Tiana continued as the group toasted her again and Bex thanked them. Kelly's crush is sitting over there with some other girl. What? Where? Derek looked around at the crowd. Stop it, Kelly hissed. The cute guy? Blondish brown hair, glasses near the door. She's the brunette with the red blouse on, Tiana supplied. She's hot, Derek observed before he turned back to the group. That's your crush? I don't see the deal. Kelly sighed. He's really nice. His son Avery and Bentley are friends at the new school. He looks like a 50s throwback. Derek raised an eyebrow and sipped his beer. Company man. Says the man who works at a law firm and dresses like a company man each day? Kelly said dryly. He's in insurance. I think he's supposed to look like that. Doesn't exactly make your heart go pitter-patter, Tiana agreed. Sorry, Kelly. That's because you haven't seen his eyes or heard him speak, Kelly replied softly. There's something there that just makes me think, wow. Enough with the gooey feelings, Derek cut in. Where's Tomlin? Right here. Tomlin put down a pitcher of beer and some change on the table. He grabbed his seat. What have you been up to this year? Derek asked. Classified as always. Tomlin smiled as he held up his glass. To the weekend. To the weekend, the group replied. Dylan felt old. It had been a long time since he'd done the bar scene, and he just wasn't that person any more. He had spied Kelly amongst her friends and thought they all looked young and carefree. He tried to pay attention to what Rhonda was saying, but all he really wanted to do was go home. They had talked over the hospital insurance deals, and he felt like there was nothing else to say on the subject. He hoped Rhonda didn't get any ideas about their having dinner together. He wasn't interested in mixing work with pleasure. As he paid the bill, Dylan took another quick look in Kelly's direction. They seemed like they were having a lot of fun. Good. Kelly deserves some fun. He escorted Rhonda to the parking lot where she met her cab for her ride home. She had hinted that he could drive her to her apartment for a nightcap. Dylan declined. Now she was angling for a good night kiss. Dylan firmly shook her hand and stated that he looked forward to her report. It was obvious Rhonda was disappointed, but Dylan wasn't going to worry over that. Their relationship was professional only. He watched her drive away and phoned to check in on the boys. The housekeeper assured him Avery and Caden were fine. Both were asleep. He was about to thank Maria and tell her that he would be home shortly when the phone was ripped out of his hand. "'Hi, Maria,' a tall blonde said into the phone, while an almond-skinned woman with fuzzy black hair stood in front of him, allowing the blonde to walk away, talking to his housekeeper. "'That's my phone,' Dylan frowned at the woman in front of him. He recalled seeing her from sitting beside Kelly at the table inside the bar. "'It is?' she blinked up at him innocently. "'Bex has it now. I think Kelly is right. There really is something about your voice and eyes.' "'Pardon me?' Dylan narrowed his eyes and used a tone of voice that worked often on his sons. "'I would like my phone back now.' The woman blinked. Change of subject. Do you like Kelly? Excuse me, Dylan said flatly. He walked past her to the blonde and held out his hand. Give me my phone. Bex ended the call and stuffed the phone into her bra. Oops. 
Dylan closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose for a moment. What is all of this about, ladies? We want to know if you like Kelly. Beck stared up at him with huge, doe-like eyes. She's an amazing person, and we all feel very protective of her, especially after everything she went through with Christopher. She has a crush on you, so we'd like to know how you feel about her. Kelly had a crush on him? Dylan shook away the thought. Ladies, I think you have both had a little too much to drink. Mrs. Islington is a wonderful person, and I am glad she has such good friends. Now, could I have my phone, please? No, Bex replied sweetly. The other woman came to lean on Bex's shoulder. I don't think you were supposed to tell him Kelly has a crush on him. Bex frowned. Tiana, we agreed on this. Caveman style. Okay. Dylan forced a tight smile and pulled out his keys. I'm just going to report the phone stolen. Have a good night and don't drive. No, cried Tiana and grabbed him by the arm before he could leave. You can't go. He palmed his keys. There was no way he was going to lose them to these two. I have to go home to my boys. Please let go of my arm. I told Maria you wouldn't be home for the weekend, Bex piped up. I think she was a little surprised, but glad that you are getting out. You what? Dylan looked incredulously at Bex. He saw her eyes shift behind him and the bottom dropped out of his stomach. A memory surfaced, and in a flash he realized this was a lot like that setup in Honduras. Max and he had almost been robbed, or worse, when exploring the countryside than when they were a lot younger. Dylan ducked and pivoted to the left, dragging Tiana, who refused to let go of his arm, trying to put a zip tie over his hand. His shoulder banged into the rock-hard abdomen of a hulk of a guy that he barely got a glimpse of before a sack descended over his head. Dylan struggled. He managed to hook his leg around and stomped hard on the back of the guy's knee, causing him to fall to the pavement. Dylan pulled the sack off his head as he ran, realizing that his hands had been zip-tied together during the commotion. He looked back, which was a mistake, because he tripped over something and fell, his face hitting the bumper of a car as he fell. Dylan lay stunned on the pavement. His jaw hurt. One of the lenses of his glasses had cracked, creating a spider web across his vision. There was ringing in his ear. The guy hauled him up. With the girl's help, they stuffed him in the trunk of a car and missed giggles. Once the lid of the trunk closed, Dylan hit the panic button on his keys. It didn't seem to matter, because he could feel the engine of the car he was in start and drive away from the blaring horn of his own coupe. Dylan tried to move, but there was so much stuff crammed around him, there was no room. He could hear the radio turned up, blaring tunes as they drove. Just what kind of friends did Kelly have? Dylan gingerly felt along his jaw, and the goose egg that was starting to form. His hands were tied, but at least he didn't have the sack over his head. He thought hard about his situation. He wasn't expected at work until Tuesday. His housekeeper had probably been conned by Bex to think the same. It was Friday night. He had no idea where they were taking him, or what they were going to do. He didn't expect them to seriously hurt him, since he had seen exactly who they were. However, Dylan wasn't going to sit in the trunk calmly waiting. He felt along in the darkness until he knew exactly what way he was facing. Taking his keys, he worked on prying off the plastic cover near his head. It should be the panel that covered the back lights on the driver's side of the vehicle. It took some persistence, yet Dylan managed to crack the cover open. He reached in and yanked on the wiring as hard as he could. That took doing, but eventually the wires gave. He really wished that he had a flashlight to see the wires. He could only guess. Dylan felt around, then pressed the wire against the appropriate area in short, then long bursts of three. Classic S.O.S. He only hoped someone would recognize it from the brake light as they drove behind his car and called in to the cops. Eventually, he must have dozed. He wondered if he had a concussion. They were at a gas station getting fuel. He started yelling and hitting the top of the trunk with his fists, but the girl started caterwauling loudly, turning up the radio. Dylan tried the wire again, tapping out his message of distress, but he heard a sharp male laugh. I'm getting to like this guy better all the time. The voice had to belong to the tank of a guy who had stuffed Dylan in the trunk. Dylan listened as the light cover was removed and then the bulbs themselves were taken out. He could see a tiny bit of light through the holes. Dylan sighed as the light cover was replaced, 
They would be driving with only one tail light. Dylan hoped that they would get pulled over by the police for the violation. Otherwise, he was out of options until the trunk opened. They drove again for a long time. Dylan had no way to judge time. Finally, he slept. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please click the bell for notifications so that you don't miss any videos, including upcoming chapters of this audiobook. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.